all the unique characters. I do let them bang. Yeah, I say, like, yeah, I'm a legend, man. I'm building my legs. All the stories and perspectives featured weekly. I wasn't fully committed to that choke, and I kind of sunk into it, started squeezing tighter, and I kind of heard him gurgle a little bit. I was like, oh. And all the combat sports you could ask for in the best state in the U.S. Like I said, Ohio versus the world. It's gonna happen, for sure. Watch out. It'll be cool, man. I'm not worried about it. I'm gonna show them why the Ohio MMA scene is, in my opinion, one of the best MMA scenes in the country. This is Forged in OH. IO. OH. IO. OH. IO. Hello everyone and welcome to episode 71 of Forged in Ohio. My name is Jake Murin and I'm the host of the podcast. Hope you all enjoyed last week's episode with Tony the Latin Assassin at Tortorisi. It was just what we needed to kick off the month of April. I also recently did another live pro weigh-in show for Cage Thunder, Cage Thunder 26, so I appreciate all of your support with that now for the reason you're all listening or watching joining me today is the sixth ranked pound for pound pro fighter in the state of ohio he owns a seven and six record in mixed martial arts has experience in kickboxing on team usa as well and represents rising dragon mma it's tobias freight train taylor thanks for coming on the show tobias and welcome on in to forge in ohio no problem man yeah thanks for having me of course, man. I know we talked recently at your most uh, your most recent kickboxing event. I told you then it'd be nice to have you on the show. We're finally making do on that and getting you on Forge in Ohio. So I appreciate the time. And I want to start actually with your latest win in mixed martial arts, improving to seven and six on March 23rd with a unanimous decision win. Can you talk me through that fight, how it played out from round to round, and just overall what you think you did uh, well in there? That fight, yeah, I, I feel like the whole fight went pretty good um the first round i kind of you know filling him out a little bit the second round i feel like i kind of got his tempo got his pace um the third round is just i took him down and i held him down for the whole round and pretty much had my way with him the whole fight is that something you've been trying to do lately in fights show off your grappling i know you have a wrestling background but notoriously you're known for your striking and your kickboxing right being able to show that other dimension to your game the grappling aspect yeah, I mean, I do a lot of training and grappling. You know, I go to Real Pro for Jiu Jitsu, and you know, I, I do a lot of a lot of training lately. I've been, you know, stepping up, stepping it up. So, um, really, honestly, I'm just prepared for the fight to go wherever. But, um, you know, guys, they want to take me down, and you know, I gotta, I gotta go to Jiu Jitsu and be prepared for that. You know, my guys, uh, Steve, and all my guys at Real Pro, you know, they get me going. You know, so. Yeah, so it sounds like maybe in the middle of the second round is finally when you got a good read on what he was doing what he, and what he had to offer. Are you a fighter that maybe takes not round one off per se, but uses that round to download the data and then process it and apply it and, and really beat him at his own game? I think I got a reputation for taking round one off, but like not on purpose. It's just something that I end up doing just because I, I think I'm trying to fill out the fight. But... You know, I, I'm really not sure. Honestly, I just kind of go in there and take it like play by play by play. Like I'm not really going in there and like I don't really like game plans. It's not really my thing. I like to go in there and just kind of like fill the fight out and wherever the fight goes, that's where it go. So I, I just want to be ready for whatever. Yeah, man. So are you trying to become a better first round fighter or is that just your style? You know, kind of like a Piotr Jan in the UFC, you know, he made it all the way to UFC championship by just downloading the data in the first few rounds and then, you know, picking it up later on as the fight goes on. Right. No, I think honestly, a lot of my losses come from guys outpacing me and me trying to play catch up. So if I can get in there in the first round and start picking up the pace and taking guys out early on, I think that up my stock a lot. Yeah, this last fight, your opponent was four and three coming in with all but one fight going the distance coming in. Did you expect the fight to go long and to to see the judges scorecards like it did? Uh, after the fight, I knew I won 30-27. I knew I had the fight in the bag. But I didn't really expect the fight to go any type of way. I just, you know, like I said, I, I like to kind of just play by play, you know, take the fight at a moment per moment basis, you know, I don't really like to game plan 
game plans they never go the way you want it to so it's like okay you got a game plan you know you practice you train for about three four weeks and you got this game plan and next thing you know he comes out he's doing something completely different you're like oh the game plan didn't even work so the game plan goes out the door and you got to go and do something else so i don't like the game plan so i i like to take the fight play by play you know moment at, at a moment to moment basis yeah, do you think a game plan in mixed martial arts can sometimes serve as a distraction? Because if that game plan doesn't work and you didn't plan and you didn't have like a plan B or C, then right. you are just trying to stick to what's not working and it's not going to work and you're going to lose that fight, if that makes sense. Exactly. I mean, I've had fights like that before where like I had a game plan and it, it didn't go my way and it's like, okay, now, now I'm trying to adapt. And it may, it may take a minute or two to adapt and you're just trying to play catch up at that point. Where I feel like, especially on a regional level, you, you got to go out there and just kind of be aggressive, like, right away. You know, amateurs and pro, you got you to gotta be aggressive. You know, you got to put that foot, foot on the gas pedal. This ain't boxing. Ain't 12 rounds. We got three rounds. Get the job done and get in and get out. Yeah, so having no game plan is one thing, but also knowing a little bit about your opponent is another. How much like studying do you do of your opponent, or do you let that to your uh, to your coaches, and then they let you know, hey, this might work? Or are you completely going in there blind and just feeling it out and going from there? I'm not completely blind. I do watch, but I'm not like studying. Like, oh, I'm gonna take them down, and I I, I like to see tendencies. So, like, it, let's say got, the guy likes to throw his rear leg roundhouse kick. I'm going to pick up on that, and I'm going to work on my counters. But to me, that's not really a game plan. That's more just of a, a strategy, you know? Yeah, it's like a fighting basic, you know? Right, yeah. I like to pick up on strategies and, like, what, that guy, what my guy likes to do so I can capitalize off of it. But I really don't want to, like, oh, I, I got to – I don't know. Some people just put too much into the game plan and it just never works out that way. Yeah, and I'm sure it allows you to be free in there too, right? Not being restricted or having that constantly in your mind like, hey, my coach has drilled this into me. Let's do this and this. It just lets you be free and do whatever you want to get to that win. Right. Well, yeah, because we're doing mixed martial arts. So to, to try to focus on one game plan, that shouldn't be the, the, the main course of action. Like it should be to really just be sound at everything we do. Everything you do, you got to be a sound wrestler. You got to be good on the ground. You got to be good striking, good defense, good offense, good pressure, and knowing when to use it, you know, in that moment too, like moment to moment basis. You can't just sit there and think that, you know, you're going to play defense and this guy's not throwing any offense. So if he's not throwing any offense, how are you going to play defense? You know, now you got to switch up, play a little bit more offense. Being able to to really see that in that moment and, and adapt is important. So for me, like my coaches, they may they may come with a game plan. My my jujitsu coach, he have you know, he always comes up with a game plan for me. But me, I just take the fight, I like the flow like Bruce Lee, you know, like water. You gotta be like water. Yeah, man, I love that approach to the fight game. It's a, a unique one. I don't really hear that much on Fortune Ohio, so it's kind of refreshing to hear that from a fighter as well. Correct me if I'm wrong on this one, but like, I don't think you had a ton of time to prepare for this fight on March 23rd. I know your experience, but with that along with this being the main event of an 18-fight card, what were the nerves like and how were you feeling going in? The fight was at 12.30 at night, so I fought at 12.30. It was late. And I, I was tired. I'm in bed by 10 o'clock. I got to be up at 5, you know. So I'm in bed early. And I was tired, honestly. I was really tired and still a little, a little dehydrated from the weight cut. But the nerves, honestly, like, I'm, what, 13 fights in and out. I don't get as nervous as I used to. I think it's just more controlled. Controlled nerves. Now I can control it. And I'm starting to know myself a little more, a little better. So it's just like, okay, well, I've been here before. I've been cut. I've been dropped. Um, I've been tapped out. So nothing can really, nothing new can happen to me, you know, that somebody else hasn't already done to me. So it's like, I keep that in mind. And it's like, okay, worst case scenario is I get knocked out or I get tapped out. That's already happened to me. So, <laughs> you know, chin down, guards up, bite down on your mouthpiece and go forward, you know. 
Yeah, for sure, man. So it's twelve thirty p or twelve thirty a.m. I guess is that the latest uh, time you've ever fought? Huh? Yep. Man, so do you almost prefer not to be the main event, or maybe the card to start earlier? That way, you're not fighting that late. Well, I'd prefer the card to fight earlier, and for there to also not be eighteen fights on the card. But yeah, you know, that's a big fight card. But it is what it is. You know, we're fighters, so you know we gotta adapt. Yeah, that's a long night of fights for sure, man. 18 fights on one card. That's a bunch. But when you were there, you know, fighters talk about peaking at the right time. Did you have any concern of peaking too early, knowing that your fight was going to be so late? Not really. So I did peak at around 12 o'clock. Just, you know, getting ready, thinking that the fight was going to occur a little bit sooner than it did. And I ended up peaking at 12 and... I had to kind of just calm down because I realized that we had an intermission left and we had two more pro fights. So it's like, okay, calm down, sit down, relax. You know, it's all a part of the fight game, you know, all a part of the, the process, you know, just, it's not just about going in there, throwing, kicking, throwing kicks and punches, you know, you gotta, you gotta approach the fight the right way. And honestly, like every, every single moment matters that whole day, you know, you gotta drink the right amount of water. You got to try to take a nap. You got to stretch at the right time. You got to, every single thing matters. And if you throw one thing off, you can throw everything off, you know? Yeah. Being about 10 or so days removed away from this fight, how happy are you with your performance? I am not that satisfied. I feel like I'm definitely better than what I showed. And I think, I think I've showed better in the past. But, you know, I, I dominated 30-27 all across the board. My striking was landing. I took him down. I wrestled him, landed some ground and pound. So, I mean, outside eyes looking in, like my coaches, they might say, hey, Tobias, you did great. But my my oldest brother, my main coach, Taiwan, he's my biggest critic. So, you know, he's like, oh, well, you should have been more aggressive or you should have did this, you should have did that. And I think that kind of sometimes plays, you know, playing my head like, oh, okay, I, I could have did this better. I could have been a little bit more aggressive or I really haven't been hurt bad from strikes ever in a fight. So I need to keep my chin down and, and throw throw hard punches, you know, in the pocket. You know, I, I really don't have to worry about guys catching me because I haven't really been caught much in a fight. So. There is definitely things I can improve on and I'm going to have to improve on as, you know, as I continue to progress. But overall, I think I give myself like a B minus in that fight. I, I give myself a B minus. All right. B minus isn't too bad. But is that the perfectionist speaking inside of you, knowing that you did dominate, but you weren't no, necessarily satisfied, like you said, with with how you did out there? Yeah, I think so. Yeah, definitely. You also mentioned your coach being your older brother. What's that dynamic like? <laughs> don't get me started um uh, i mean he's been my coach since i was six seven years old so um and he's always been there and you know sometimes that brother coach dynamic can kind of clash i've seen it i don't know if he's ever noticed it but i've seen it but on the flip side it's a blessing because he knows me like you know like you know, no one else, you know, it's my brother. So he knows me. He knows my tendencies. He knows what gets me going. He knows if he needs to back off. He knows how I respond to, you know, different words. And so it's a blessing in that way where nobody else could really, you know, I could go to another gym down the street or, you know, in a different city, but they wouldn't know me like, you know, how my brother knows me. So. Now, does he have any experience in fighting, kickboxing, anything like that? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Taiwan, he fought for years. I mean, Taiwan did amateur kickboxing, pro kickboxing. He did uh, point karate. Um, he turned pro in MMA. He has about, he had about 20 MMA fights, professional. Oh, wow. So when did he, when was his last fight? When did he hang it up, per se? I think he fought Chris Curtis, and, uh, you know, Taiwan was a bit older during that fight, and Chris Curtis was kind of heading into his prime. 
and uh, it didn't go his way. So he decided to, you know, that was be his, that would be his last one. Yeah, Chris Curtis, man, another Ohio guy fighting your brother, of course. Uh, so who's the better brother? You or your uh, you're a coach? <laughs> uh, uh, you know, it's all about the next generation, right? So, like, he's supposed to pass down the torch, and I'm supposed to be better than he was, and so on. If my son ever decides to fight, I want him to him to be better than me. So, you know, I'm going to go with me. <laughs> But I don't know. He might not, you know, he might think otherwise. So, Yeah, I love the confidence. You mentioned your son. Would you want him to fight one day? If he wants to. Yeah. I mean, he's only 11 months, so we're just trying to get him crawling and walking right now. One day, if he wants to, I, would, you know, I'd love to coach him and be in his corner. How has being a father changed your, not only your life, but also just fighting too? Maybe fighting for something else other than yourself. Um, I haven't really experienced that part, honestly. Like, I still, I think I fight for myself. But I, I don't know. I mean, that's a good question. I mean, I've gained more weight, you know, because I live with my family now, you know, my girl and my son. So I've gained more weight. Weight cuts are harder. But uh, I don't know. People from outside eyes looking in, people think that, you know, I've gotten better or matured as a fighter and as a person, but I'm just taking it a day at a time, you know? Yeah, for sure, man. You're now on a two-fight win streak in MMA, which is tied for your second longest as a pro. Looking at your topology, I've noticed that you go on stretches in mixed martial arts where you win a lot in a row, and then you drop a few in a row. How do you ensure that that trend stops now and you can build off the momentum that you've been able to build lately? I think I got a good recipe. Now, like the recipe is pretty much tried and true or before I was kind of like trying different things and trying to figure out what works, what doesn't work, what style of training camp works, what style of training camp doesn't work, what foods to eat, what not to eat. But now I think I have the recipe, you know, I I know what to eat. I know when to eat it. I know uh, when to do cardio, when I should back off of cardio and do a little bit more strength training, when to go to jujitsu want to focus on my wrestling so I think it's just really knowing me and knowing what I need to do you know in in those moments so I you know lately I've been doing a lot of jujitsu a lot of wrestling and when I when I'm training in jujitsu consistently three times a week four times a week for months on end it's really hard to beat me honestly but a lot of times there are stretches where, you know, months go by and I'm doing jujitsu maybe once or twice um, every couple of weeks, you know. So I think I, I just need to stay consistent and in my training and keep it well-rounded, you know. Is that one of the hardest parts of being a fighter, just making sure you are consistent, consistently being in the gym, but also being consistent in training each aspect that goes into the sport? Yeah, I think you got to be consistently in the gym and you definitely got to train every aspect of the sport. You know, if you don't, you're going to slack and you're going to fight some guy who who doesn't take a day off and all he does is wrestle twice a day, you know, six times a week. And, you know, you're going to have your hands full, you know. Yeah, I love how you've described this recipe that you've crafted almost that has you where you are right now in your career. Do you think your record of seven and six shows who you are as a fighter or are you much better than the record may portray? Oh, no. Yeah, I'm definitely better than seven and six. I mean, if you just check my resume, you know, you see guys like Patrick Mix, Gerald Hodge, you see Chapman, you see Ethan Goss, you see a bunch of guys that I've lost to and these guys are all fighting on the next level or have fought on the next level. And then you see a guy like me where I'm beating these regional guys and I'm, I'm some of these guys I'm like dominating and they have good records. So I don't think my record really shows who I am as a fighter, but I mean, really the only time to tell, you know, I'm just going to keep fighting, keep doing my thing, hopefully keep winning and, sign a contract UFC or Bellator one championship you know hopefully they they can overlook my record and not hold that against me 
especially with my kickboxing experience. You know, we see guys like Mark Hunt. He didn't come into the UFC with a crazy UFC or MMA record, but, you know, he had a kickboxing background. Izzy, I think Izzy started his pro career, um, pro MMA career, um, with a few MMA fights. So his pro UFC career, same thing with Alex Perea, you know. So I, I just think, you know, I hope that these higher organizations can overlook my record at seven to six and really kind of dive deep into who I am as a fighter and type of guys that I fought in my uh, level of competition. Yeah, for sure, man. And do you think you're at a point now where you've built that foundation to where you can extend the two fight winning streak that you're on, which could propel you to bigger and better things in combat sports, like you said, getting signed to one of these major promotions? Yeah, I think these, man, these regional guys, they, they're not as good as me. Honestly, they're not as good as me. And I've fought, like, like I said, I've fought, you know, big names on a regional scene and I've won some, I lost some, and now I think I'm kind of breaking through a threshold of fighting a guy that's four and three who fought other guys that are three and three on a lower on a lower tier. And I just don't think their level of competition, the guys that they fought, I don't think they fought the type of guys I fought. So I think I'm getting ready to break a threshold. I'm 31 years old. I don't have too much time left, so I got to do it now. Yeah, is that frustrating at all, knowing that all these regional guys aren't to the skill level that you are, and you almost want to fight those guys that are at your skill level, or maybe better to test yourself in the sport? I'd like LFA or CFFC to hit me up, you know, because I know that's where the top guys go, um, the top regional guys go, they go to CFFC, uh, LFA, WFC, I fought for WFC before, and I, I want to continue to test myself, of course, but I want I want winnable fights as well. You know, a lot of not saying that you know the guys that you know I have fought, I I can I wouldn't have been able to beat them, but I'm tired of fighting the toughest toughest guys ever. You know, like, give me give me a normal four and three guy. Give me a normal guy that that you know. So whatever. I mean, I've tested myself already. I've already fought the toughest down dotters, you know, in the area. Like, give me some normal dude. I'm not a gatekeeper, you know. But I think I do think I'm at the level now to where at seven and six, if I fought these guys, I will beat them. Or before I was coming up short against top level guys, I think I'm ready to start winning and dominating. Yeah, and it helps your record too when you're not fighting those top level guys. You're seven and six right now. Maybe it makes that uh, record look a little bit more attractive to those big promotions down the line. Right. Exactly. Exactly. I need I need some uh some 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 wins definitely under my record. Is that the big goal of yours right now to get to that big stage to be signed by one of those major promotions that you listed earlier? Yeah. Mm. All right, man. I'm, well, I'm excited to see you get there one day. Talking with Tobias Freight Train Taylor with us here on Forged in Ohio. All right, man, let's talk about kickboxing. We've mentioned it a few times already. When did you first try out kickboxing, and what encouraged you to get into that discipline? I had my pro kickboxing debut just last year, but I, I've have, I have ton, a ton of amateur fights. I have like probably more than I can count. I got like 20 amateur kickboxing fights all from when I was like 13 to now, you know, and, um, you know, it's just something that I grew up doing, uh, kickboxing, karate. I grew up, you know, in the gym doing karate. So it's just kind of like second nature, you know, it's like my go-to martial art, you know? So I always knew I'd like to kickbox. It's just, it's not a whole lot of kickboxing in the area. But Ryan Madigan, he uh, put on the show Extreme Kickbox, and I love that show. He put he puts on an awesome show, and uh, he gave me opportunity to fight on his platform, and I won my my uh, pro debut by first round knockout. So, yeah, there you go, man. So I know you were a kickboxer for Team USA in 2021. I'm not going to pretend to be an expert in this field, but what was that experience like representing your country? And I'm assuming having to work pretty hard to earn that opportunity as well. Yeah, man, honestly, that's probably the hardest I've ever trained was uh, to get on the national team and to go fight over there in Italy. And um, 
it, it's surreal, you know, it's kind of like a dream come true in a way, you know, it, it's definitely an experience that it's like once in a lifetime, you know, I'll be telling my, my son about it and my grandkids about that, you know, going over to Italy, that was my first time ever out the country. I got to see Rome, Venice, you know, things that, you know, I never really thought that I'd go see, you know, um, I'm from the west side of Cleveland, like, you know, to go to Rome and Venice, it's just, it's surreal, it's crazy. And uh, yeah, you know, it was an awesome experience and I would love to get back on Team USA and maybe continue to travel. Uh, I think they're going to Spain next and, you know, they go all over the place, all over the world. So it's a big organization, shout out to Waco. And yeah, it's, it's a cool experience. Yeah, where does that experience rank among the best experiences you've had in combat sports? Maybe a top number one? I mean, it's definitely in the top three. It's in the top three. Uh, one good experience I had as a mixed martial artist was going out to Kentucky, and I fought uh, a 10-0. He was 10-0 in an amateur, and he was making his pro debut against me. He was a six foot three. His name is David, David Rankin. And I went out there and I dominated. I don't know, that that moment, that fight sticks in my head. That's one of my favorite fights because I, I went out there, I dominated in his hometown. You know, he had his girlfriend there. <laughs> it felt good to beat him up in front of his family. I ain't even going to lie. <laughs> that was one of my favorite moments. 6'3". <laughs> yeah, he was 6'3 at Featherweight. Yeah, it was crazy. Yeah, that's insane. And you dominated. How'd you go on to uh, win that fight? I beat him standing up. I beat him on the ground. I beat him in the clinch. I was just beating that boy up. That felt good. I ain't even going to lie. Like, that was one of my favorite. That's in the top three. Though. Do you enjoy playing that heel role, going into somebody else's hometown and showing the crowd and making the crowd go home a little upset that night? Right. Yeah, it definitely. It makes me feel good, you know. Well, going back to being the kickboxer for Team USA in 2021, talking about just competing in Italy, what was that experience like? And was there even more pressure? I know we talked about anxiety for your last fight, but that being two years ago on that stage in another country, what was that experience like? In Italy? In Italy? It was a different time period, different time zone. So, like, I think my body was trying to adjust to the different time zone. Once I landed, once I landed, I had to cut like five pounds. So like I'm in the sign of suit, I'm in the jump rope, you know, it's morning time there, but my body probably felt like it was, you know, 3 a.m. You know, my my body was like, hey, what are you doing right now? Like, why are you cutting weight? Like, you, you should be sleeping right now. The sun was out and um, yeah, I was cutting weight with the sign of suit on. Um, it was, it was, I don't know. It was cool. You know, I, it was just like fighting here, to be honest with you. Like it was just, I fought some guy from Serbia. Um, he was just a better fighter. He won that fight, but it was just like fighting anywhere else. You know, recently you dropped your last kickboxing fight to Jordan Willis on social media. You said it could have gone either way. And it seemed like you were pretty frustrated about a knockdown in the fight that was counted as a slip. I believe, are you still annoyed by that? And do you think you should have won that fight? No, I'm over it. You know, I'm over it. It was definitely a close fight, but it could have went either way. I do think my two knockdowns, it was two of them. I knocked him down twice. And he butt scooted against the canvas. It was a clear knockdown. But uh, it is what it is. I'll let bygones be bygones. You know, I can't control that. So it is what it is. Is that a frustrating difference for you when it comes to MMA and kickboxing, whether it was a slip or knockdown in MMA? You know, you're like pouncing on him, looking to land, fight, and then ground and pound or hunt for a submission or at least get good control of him on the ground. Whereas kickboxing, you know, obviously that's not the case. It's not frustrating. It's just, you know, it is what it is. You know, that's the sport of kickboxing. It's not frustrating. I just accept it, you know? Yeah, for sure, man. So how has that experience in kickboxing impacted what you do in MMA? Whenever you fight, you can clearly see that kickboxing experience and presence in your style. I feel comfortable striking a four-ounce gloves. You know, not everybody feels comfortable striking a four-ounce gloves. You know, I think I feel very comfortable you know, in my, uh, in my habitat, 
and uh, with the four ounce gloves on. How do you plan on balancing competing in MMA and kickboxing? Do you think you'll pursue one of them more than the other moving forward, or do you enjoy doing both like you are now? I enjoy doing both. I can see myself continuing to do both at the same time. And you like to stay active, right? Competing almost every other month, it seems like, looking at your record. Yeah, well, like I said, I'm 31, so I don't have a whole lot of time left. You know, if I continue to wait, I'll be 35, and I've averaged one fight a year. You know, um, I turned pro back in 2015, and I fought once in 2015, once in 16. I think I might have fought once or twice in 17. So in my mind, it's like, well, I'm only fighting once a year. and I, you know, it, it's just time for me to pick it up. You know, being 31 years old, I, I'm i like, hey, I only got a few more years of my prime left. I, I can't be 35 talking about I wish I would have fought more, and now I'm outside of my prime. You know, so it's either now or never. So take these fights. They, they keep calling. I'm going to keep taking them. Are you in your prime right now? Yeah. So at 31 years old, being more active than you have ever been in your career, how does the body handle everything that you're going through right now? It's rough because I'm a union carpenter as well. So I put that tool belt on every morning. It's like 10, 15 pounds on my waist, you know. Uh, my body, I think my body wants to hold on to everything. Uh, like I said, it's harder for me to cut weight now. I put on 10 pounds. And I think my body just wants to hold on because it needs the energy. And I've gone through so many weight cuts that, you know, my body's like, oh, hold on. Like, hey, we need this energy. You know, you're going to work at five o'clock in the morning. You're going to training at night. So I, I think my body's really just kind of shocked right now. And plus I'm getting older. So I think it's harder for me to recover from injuries and, you know, the whole you're getting older thing. So, you know, that injury is going to linger around because, you know, you're getting older. P people think with age comes more injuries, which it does at a certain point. But at 31, you know, it's not that deep, not that big of a deal. Sure. Once again, this is Tobias Freight Train Taylor with us on Forged in Ohio. I want to ask about your gym, your uh, gym, Rising Dragon MMA. I was joined by Juan Goins not too long ago, and he was the first fighter I featured from the gym. He had a lot of good things to say, but I want to hear from you. What has Rising Dragon done for you? I mean, where can I get started? I mean, Rising Dragon has been my life. I mean, my brother, he started the gym back in 2003. And I remember helping him name the gym. You know, I was in the eighth grade and we were coming up with different names for the gym. And um, he liked Rising Dragon. I liked uh, Golden Fist. But, you know, he decided to go with Rising Dragon. And, um, yeah, man, it's definitely it's shaped me as a person. You know, as a human, um, as a father, a responsible adult, you know, and yeah, it's just, it's been a blessing for me. Golden Fist is pretty cool. Did you eventually come around to the Rising Dragon name though? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> eventually, yeah. <laughs> so you've been around for a while now, 11 years in this game. What makes Rising Dragon MMA different from other gyms in the state of Ohio? Well, for me, it's family. Um, it's a close, tight knit group of guys that we, you know, we all have one goal in mind: is to win. Um, and yeah, I mean, it's it's family. We we're a family atmosphere. We're not a big box gym. There's maybe five or six of us that fight, and you know, we're all there helping each other out. You know, helping each other get better. You know. Iron sharpens iron, you know, so I, I'm close with my guys and we go out every now and then, you know, we hang out, we kick it. We might go watch the UFC. Uh, I just had a birthday party. They all came from our birthday party. So, it, you know, it's, it's family. I would, I would, you know, I would say it's, it's family. Yeah, and even more so for you with your brother, of course. And you mentioned back in or back when you were in the eighth grade starting up the gym. Is that when you first started taking training seriously and got in there and started pursuing this career? Yeah.
Yeah, eighth grade. Yeah. That's incredible. Developing your skills for over 11 years in combat sports competing, but even longer than that, all the way back to eighth grade, there's no denying that you have elite striking and kickboxing, of course. And then you have that solid wrestling background as well. But what would you say your biggest strength is as a fighter? My biggest strength, probably my striking, I would say. My striking and my uh, composure. You've said that you're the most exciting fighter in Ohio before, and I don't necessarily disagree with that statement, but why do you think you are one of the most, if not the most, exciting fighter in this state? Because of my striking. <laughs> <laughs> not only is it good, but you have the power, huh? Yeah, yeah. I could pretty much knock out anyone in my division, I think, and, you know, in the blink of an eye. You know, they got everybody's got to be in their P's and Q's when they fight me because I have knockout power. I love the confidence, man. The confidence, it, it oozes off, man, when you say stuff like that. I really like it. Is there a, there one fight in your career, maybe, whether it be kickboxing or MMA, that you are most proud of? Maybe that 10-0 guy who was 6'3", 6'4", that you want people, that you would maybe show people and are proud of uh, the most? Yeah, I would definitely say that one. My uh, guillotine win against Sean Raw, that was a good fight for me just because it was my first ever submission. Uh, amateur and pro. Um, my kickboxing win when I knocked out that guy last year. Uh, what was his name? Blaze Rod. I forgot his name, but that was a fun fight for me. Um, whenever, whenever I can get a knockout, it's you know, it's it makes me feel good. You know, I feel like a bully saying that because I'm not a bully. I'm a nice guy, but whenever I can get a knockout, it makes me feel good. Yeah, two of your seven wins in MMA have come inside the distance. I know you have that thunderous knockout power in those hands. The freight train nickname is truly fitting. How important is it for you to get finishes moving forward? I think it's very important. You know, the UFC likes finishes, Bellator likes finishes, all these top organizations, they want finishes. So I think it's important, you know. Um, I'm never going out there looking for the finish, but if it comes... I gladly take a, you know, take a finish, you know, any day of the week. Yeah, you're one of the most experienced fighters to have ever joined me on Fortune Ohio, yet you're far from the oldest, just 31, like we mentioned. What would you say you've learned most about yourself in life in general or as a fighter in the 11 years that you've been competing? A lot, you know, honestly, I, you know, we could probably talk about this for, for hours, you know. I mean, about life, you just got to keep going. You can't quit. You know, you start something, you got to finish it. You know, things get hard, life gets hard, but you just got to keep going, you know, keep moving. During the tough times, you know, you just got to keep moving. You know, when life gets hard, breathe, stretch, you know. Uh, food. Some people don't put good food on their body, and... It shows, not just physically, but mentally as well, you know. Um, I've learned that I operate a lot better when I'm eating uh, vegetables and fruits and berries and avocados, and I'm sharper mentally. And when I'm eating uh, cookies and cake and chocolate, which are my vices, I'm a little bit sluggish. I'm not as sharp mentally, and that transfers over to physically. You know, I take nutrition very seriously because I understand what it can do for not just an athlete, but the average everyday person. You know, if I had better nut nutrients and nutrition in grade school, I would have made better grades. You know, same thing with college. I didn't drink coffee growing up. If I would have drink, drink coffee, you know, before school in the morning, I would have probably been a little bit more sharper. You know, little things like that, you know, I. I take nutrition, you know, seriously. Um, you know, you learn so much about yourself, you know, your sleep schedule. You know, you need to sleep whenever you put in a hard days of work. You can't just stay up and party like you were 21 years old. You got to sleep, you know, get to bed at 10 o'clock so you can wake up at 5 and be productive for the rest of the day. You know, it's not like a... It's not one specific thing that I've learned. It's just more of a who 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 I have became, 
and become throughout the years, you know, during my fight career, if that makes sense. Yeah, I think through the 11 years that you've been competing, it sounds like you've molded and learned so much about yourself and molded yourself into the person that you are now. At what points in your career did you pick up those lessons of, hey, I do need to be taking more control of my body, whether it's what I'm putting into it or making sure that I get the sleep necessary to perform at the best level I possibly can. I'm sure it wasn't in 2013 when you made your amateur debut. So when did that eventually come around? No, you you know, you learn different things throughout the years. You know, you hop on Google and you, you know, you ask Google, hey, what's uh, the best foods for inflammation? And you learn that is turmeric and berries. And so now when you have an injury or you're overtraining, you got to, you know, get rid of some of that inflammation. You know, okay, now I need to, you know, eat some berries and, you know, drink some turmeric tea, you know. So you, you learn things throughout the years, you know, um, you learn how to cut weight better. I've learned how to cut weight better, you know, um, you know, a ton of different things. And like I said, you know, throughout the years, throughout the years, um, at 21, I didn't know much. But, you know, at 31, you know, I know a lot more about, you know, just the fight game in general. What would you say to 21-year-old Tobias Frey Train Taylor if you could go back in time and give them a piece of advice or two about this whole fighting career that you're embarking on, how it would play out? What would you tell them? Um, I would tell him to stay patient and to take care of yourself physically and mentally. Uh, drink water. And... The main thing will probably be to work on your weaknesses. You know, don't don't neglect your weaknesses. Um, j- just continue to keep working on yourself and yeah, your weaknesses. Yeah, is it maybe hard to you know work on those weaknesses when you're so good at maybe one or two disciplines and you're just so attracted to those in the gym and practicing and drilling those and maybe you neglect some other part that's really important in in, in this game. Yeah, yeah, because you want to do what you're good at. You know, I can go to the gym and kick and punch all day, and it's fun. You know, it's not as fun. You know, getting on the mat and you know, working submission defense for a couple hours, you know, that's not as fun. It's not as fun uh, drilling, getting up off your back when you got your teammates that weighs twice as much as you sitting on top of your chest, punching you on the face, and now you got to work on getting up off your back. That's not as fun. So it's easy to go and do the fun things, but it's hard to do what you really need to do, you know. Yeah, and how fulfilling is it when you start training on those weaknesses and see it all come together like it's supposed to in MMA. It is very fulfilling. It makes you want to keep going and keep doing it. You know, and that's where discipline comes into play. Are you going to go back to your comfort zone or are you going to continue to work on your weaknesses, you know? Yeah, I, of course, have to ask you about when fans can expect to see you back in the cage or even in a kickboxing ring, too. When would you like to return following your win just a couple of weeks ago? Well, I'm scheduled for a fight May 11th in PA. I can't tell you versus who because they want to announce it first. But I'm I'm scheduled for PA uh, May 11th. Be on the lookout. Follow me on social media, Facebook, Instagram. And, uh, you know, I'll keep y'all updated. May 11th, is that MMA? Yeah. All right, man. That's a not too quick of a turnaround. I know we're early in March right now, but is that the kind of the time frame you were hoping for? Yeah, yeah, I'm trying to stay active. Like I said, I'm 31. You know, I'm getting up there. I don't have a whole lot of time left. I don't, I really don't want to fight past 37. That's like my my peak. And not my peak, but you know, that's my cutoff. So 37 and I'm done. You know, so I'm trying to rank, rank them out now, you know. I'm trying to get all the big wins I can get now. Bellator UFC hit me up. You know, stop playing. <laughs> you know, I know I'm one of the most exciting fighters in Ohio. Stop playing with me. There you go, man. So May 11th in PA. I know you can't announce the opponent quite yet, but what can fans expect to see out of you uh, going to PA and fighting on May 11th? I'll be a little bit bigger. I'm going up a weight class. And, um, and you can see what you always see. You know, an exciting fighter. 
Um, yeah, an exciting fighter. You know, I'm one of the best in the game. There you go, man. I can't wait for it. I'm sure all of Ohio MMA fans can't wait for it as well. And they're going to be rooting for you too, knowing that you're going to another state and fighting a guy who may or may not be from there as well. Before we wrap up, is there just anything you want to shout out or plug here at the back end of the podcast? Yeah, shout out to my team, Rising Dragon. Uh, shout out to my Union Carpenters, 373, what up? Uh, shout out to, you know, my, uh, the wifey, you know, she. She's been cooking my meals for me and, you know, uh, rubbing my back when I'm sore after a workout, you know. And, uh, yeah, that's it. All right. Thanks again, Tobias, for joining me on the show. It was great to catch up after meeting you at your most recent kickboxing fight. Before I get you out of here, man, I I enjoy doing the OHIO chant with my guests to uh, get them out of here. So, (laughs) OHIO. Thanks, Tobias. Thanks again for coming on the show. I'm looking forward to seeing how you build off your winning streak in MMA on May 11th. And you bet we'll talk again soon, man. All right, Jake. Thanks for having me, man. That was Tobias Freight Train Taylor, the 7-6 and six professional mixed martial artist. Tobias has a ton of combat sports experience, and that translates to how skilled he's become. Plus, he's won two straight in MMA, so he's building a lot of momentum right now, too. This is the fourth straight episode where the fighter joining me has fought at least six times, with two of them being pro fighters. So I hope you've enjoyed hearing from some more experienced mixed martial artists lately, but there's no doubt that I still have my eyes on several young prospects in this Ohio MMA space. If you have one in mind that you've been dying to hear from on the show, then reach out to me at Forged in Ohio on both Instagram and Facebook. We are a podcast of the people at the end of the day before i get you out of here i want to remind you all to download episodes wherever you're listening and go subscribe to the youtube channel for even more content thank you all for watching or tuning in i've been your host jake murrin and this was forged in ohio